This morning, uh, Bad Religion Part 2, um, talking about judgmental people this morning. Ooh. I was talking about us last week and how we can refuse to feel like God has completely accepted us through Jesus, and that can create some serious issues. Um, and then um, we, we talked about how God embraces us through Jesus Christ as we are and begins to work on us and work in us. Now, it would be wrong for me to talk about bad religion without talking to you guys about the judgmental experiences that people have. And so, you know, with the expanse of social media, I'm finding this to be at an ever increasing issue. Like people are just launching rocks and whatever they can get their hands on from one side to the other and inflicting as much pain as they can. Even if it's not a Christian or it might be a Christian who believes differently, um, you know, the denominationalism is becoming a bigger issue for some people and and. And um, people are getting irritated about like simple things. I mean, just like really, really silly things. And so, um, but, but here's, the, here's the honest part that we've got to ask ourselves this morning. And we've got to talk to ourselves for just a little bit. It's easy for us to say, well, the judgmental Christians are those people. You know, those kind of people. Let's, let's all take a minute to reflect on ourselves and realize that we are all a tad or a lot judgmental ourselves. We got issues, all right? It is very common for us to, you know, we could be looking at a social media feed or someone could say something and immediately in our mind we're thinking about how bad that person is, you know? Like, oh, you are not a Christian. A Christian wouldn't act that way. Don't, you know. Anyway, something about us likes to see people pay for their misdeeds, all right? So we attack. And our attacks come from our opinion. They, they come through opinions, okay? They come through jokes that really aren't jokes. They're just meant to cut people and, and hurt them. Um, the Facebook banter and conversations. But the truth is, is every single one of us has a platform of some kind. And from that platform, we use names. We use labels, we use race to characterize, we make sure others know our thoughts. And what this is, is this launch is toxic. It is toxic the way our words can inflict harm on others. Now, we talked about last week how the Pharisees had a very specific rule base for their life, so much so that they had to wash their kettles in a specific way. And Jesus, like, like the, the Pharisees got agitated at Jesus, and they were like, how dare you sit and eat with them? They didn't clean their hands the ceremonial way. They didn't cl clean them right. And they talked about how their hands had to be cupped and then all these other things. And oh, my goodness. So what the Pharisees did is they just added more and more and more to the original words that God had said we should follow. And in Matthew 7, 1 through 6, it says this. It says, judge not that you not, or you be not judged. Now, it says in verse 2, it says, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. <laughs> and with the measure you use, it will be measured again, again for you. Now, think about this for a minute. You throwing judgments out there, you're throwing critical attitudes and thoughts about other people us being judgmental, realize that the judgment that you throw on other people is indeed going to come right back on you. And why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not consider the plank that is in your own eye? The message translation says it this way. Why do you see the sawdust in their eye without, while missing the two by four in your eye? Um, I like that. I, I mean, don't think about a two by four in someone's eye. That's just gross. Um, or how will you say to your brother, let me pull the speck out of your eye when a log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, uh, take the, the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn around and attack you. 
Now, essentially what that's saying is like create your distance from people that are, are not going to listen or not going to follow you or not going to heed what you are um, indicating or, or sharing with them. He's, he's saying don't do that, okay? But he's also calling those people that have a dilemma with others and begin to judge them. He's saying they're hypocrites. Now, how many Christian hypocrites have you met in your time of being a Christian or non-Christian, all right? There's a lot of them. Now, here's a more personal question. How many of you are hypocritical? I sure am. Oh, you know, I mean, seriously, like, if you're saying you're not hypocritical, then you're hypocritical. <laughs> all right? So oftentimes we fail to see our, our form of judgment and punishment only creates a divide and forces others out. We wonder why people do not want to invest a lot of energy in being in the church or um, being around other people that claim that they have faith because we act as the judge and jury. And our appetite is insati insatiable. What, what that means is, is that we, we find um, feeding in that. We almost lust for that. We crave to put others down. And often, most of the time, putting others down is an attempt to make us feel better about ourselves. If we begin to, you know, like the, the very thing that we're dealing with, we often find fault in other people about. And the alternative is this. We've got to seek reconciliation. We've got to restore. We've got to renew. This does nothing to feed us, though. Rather, it takes or it asks us to feed others, even those who should know better and those who, who, uh, those who have wronged us. The alternative demands that we stand under the other and recognize we are all in need of reconciliation. And we, the people of God, are called to be ministers of that reconciliation. We are the voice of the ultimate reconciliation of God through his son, Jesus. And instead of standing our ground and causing issues for people who don't believe the same way we do, we need to work at reconciling. We need to work at restoring. We need to work at renewing instead of alienating people from the church, instead of alienating people from Christianity, instead of people walking up to you and hearing that statement that you're a Christian and suddenly feel a tad bit afraid to have any kind of conversation with you. All right. A lot of people say, well, I'm not going to come into that church. The building will fall down. You know what? If the building hasn't fallen down with me coming into church week after week, it's not for them. Now, don't misunderstand, but I'm, I'm a wretched person myself. We all are. And if this many rotten people, forgive me for being so rude, this many rotten people can come in through these doors every Sunday, so can they. I think we all need to be willing to admit that we can be awful. And, 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 and when that judgmental attitude begins to take control of our life, it causes damage everywhere we go. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We are speaking for Jesus. Okay, If this is the case, if we are speaking for Jesus... What are we putting in his mouth? What words are we saying that people then begin to attribute to Jesus because of what words we're speaking, what we're talking about, the words that are coming out of us? And we cannot take a step toward reconciliation until we first love. We, is it not working? Is it... Is it I don't know what's going on. Okay. We can't take a step towards reconciliation unless we first love. Now, I'm not talking about a um, love that's not, that it's not what God would want. You know, love has been so distorted in our culture. Love has lost its significance and value because we've weakened it by all the different things that we attach to it. I think I misspelled that or miswrote that sentence if it's up there. Oh, well. Um, this is the kind of love that gives everyone a pass. 
tells everyone, or this is not the kind of love that gives everyone a pass or tells everyone they're okay and it's cool that they messed up. This is the kind of love that's not afraid to communicate when a person has made bad decisions, but this is also the kind of love that shows them an immense amount of grace and mercy. Jesus was willing to call sin out, but it always was the result of his unconditional love for them. It was always something that was immersed with compassion and mercy. The ones that Jesus, though, had the biggest issue was with was the Pharisees. Jesus had the greatest issues with those who stood against others coming to uh, faith and coming to God and being reconciled as Jesus was offering If Jesus existed today, he'd be hanging out in the pubs. He would be hanging out in the clubs. He would go and and sit down with people that were probably, you know, even house parties where people are getting hammered by whatever substance they can force into their body. That's uncomfortable, but that's real. Jesus would walk in that scene and say, hey, guys, what's going on? I mean, can you imagine certain churches like, how could you do that? In John 3, 16, a very familiar text, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God loved the world. God loved humanity. God loved all of us. God was so committed in spite of the damage that we cause, in spite of the mess that we are. He was so committed to his love for us that he would come into this world and he would allow his son to lay down his life for us. I heard a pastor say it this way. We need to expand our hearts, our comfort zones, and our friend zones. All right? We've got to expand. We've got to increase the capacity of our hearts and the capacity of our love for others. It is inconvenient to love people because love is risky. We might get rejected. We might be pushed up against. We might be the one that we give and give and give. And whoever it is that we are attempting to give to and attempting to love rejects us. I can't tell you the amount of times in ministry where I've invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, and and, in a relationship, and sharing with someone, and giving someone a lot of my time out of love only to be rejected. But I tell you what, it is totally worth it. The risk is worth it. Jesus said Christians should be known for how deeply they love, not how deeply we judge we shouldn't be known for how deep we should be known for how deeply we love and not how deeply we judge in the evangelical church today that's us the harsh edge of their personal truth has crushed many you see religion is a thief of the love of god It is a thief to the love of God. It steals from ourselves and it steals from our world the love of God. He wants our relationship with him to be characterized by love, not duty. He wants us to be genuine in our love. He wants us to focus on the needs of others without condition. And when we begin to engage religion and allow our attempts to manipulate people into living right or or to try to control people by saying, you've got to do it this way or you've got to do it this way or this way and, and, and refuse to them the opportunity to be rescued because we're telling them that they need to clean up before they come to church. <clears throat> we only cause more problems. It's a thief. So here, here's just a, a couple of phrases for you. Judgmental people talk. Loving people listen. Judgmental people talk. Loving people listen. I mean, I love to talk, as if you didn't know. Um, 
Judgmental people will talk, though. They'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. And someone will try to interject and then they'll interrupt. Someone will try to say something and then they'll just shoot back. Judgmental people are sat, they're positioned in saying, okay, this person is talking this way. So I'm going to sit back and I'm going to think of immediate ways to retaliate in my conversation with them to bring them as low as possible. But loving people shut their mouths and actually listen to where people are. I can't count the amount of times that I have heard of people being frustrated with Christians because they sit down and express what's going on in their life. And that Christian has all the answers. And they begin to throw out these pad answers, these ridiculous things in an attempt to tell this person how they should live or what they should be like or what's going to fix it without even listening to what that person is going through. If Christians and, and, and the judgmental people would just shut up for a minute and let people talk, they may be willing to hear us out if we just listened to what they're going through. Or better yet... You sit back and you listen, and you actually know what's going on before you communicate anything to them. Judgmental people get angry quickly. Loving people are contemplative. Oh, man, this one frustrates me. I've seen it all over the place. Oh, you know, look at this person. Look what they're doing. They're going to they're gonna do all, you know, like, I don't want to get political here, but this is a lot of the, you know, this is a lot of problems for Christians. Christians, uh, faith or religion has been Americanized, if I could say it that way. And we've been manipulated by culture. We've been manipulated by legislation. I'm not making any stands, but one of the things that Christians get the most angry about is political feelings. They attach politics to faith, and then it becomes problematic. I have determined that in my own walk, I have personal conversations about what I feel, but I never make huge, um, vague public statements. I am not that person that has, like, they call it clickbait. I'm not going to just post something, you know, this person this, and then we slam someone because they believe differently than us. We get agitated. How dare them do that? They're just this and they're that. They're uh. Judgmental people are done learning. Loving people are always learning. Judgmental people think they have all the answers. You don't. I don't. All right. I've been humbled a few times. I, I brought this cup this morning because I love it. Um, it says, I don't need Google. My father knows everything. Now, I say this in humor because the truth is, is my oldest daughter is constantly putting me in my place with details about things that she has learned or read or understood. And I mean, it's oh, so frustrating, oh, but it's humbling. I don't know everything. I'd like to believe I do. All right. And I've tried or attempted to tell my children that I know everything. And even when I don't know everything and I tell them to do something and they say, well, you know, whatever they say, I say, don't argue with me. Do what I told you to do. Don't look at me like that. You know, you've done it. Judgmental people are done learning, though. They assume that there's not anything else for them to understand. They assume that they have all the answers. They assume that they have it all right. I already know everything I need to know, and I'm done learning. But there have been many experiences in my life where I have learned from a person who doesn't hold the same convictions that I do. Not because they're teaching me necessarily about scripture, but teaching me about culture, teaching me about understanding things that I don't understand. We should never be done learning. Judgmental people judge, loving people care, loving people love. Judgmental people judge, loving people love. Where do you stand in all of this? We have to remember that rules are not proof of our spirituality. Nor in the Bible, however, do we find God distinguishing between levels of sin. God doesn't share our rating system. To him, all sin is equally evil. And all sinners are equally lovable. God does not share our rating system. God does not share our perspective or what we believe is true or untrue. We have this ability to rate how rotten or how bad it is and then determine how that fits into our own perspective and our own mind and then we attach that to God. We put that on him. 
And so I ask you this question, judgmental people, loving people, love people, right? So fill in that. I know I got a lot of dots there after that, but fill that in. Judgmental people, where are you at? What are you having a hard time with? What are you dealing with? What judgmental attitude are you uh, you know, caught up in? How do you perceive the world around you? How are you sitting back or standing on your platform and knocking others down because of your own personal perspective? We have a hard time looking at our own lives and seeing what's going on inside of us. It's uncomfortable to be humbled. It's uncomfortable to be honest with ourselves. It's uncomfortable to realize that there are things that we indeed need to work on. There is even pride in humility. <laughs> Where are you? Ask yourself. What's going on? Are you not listening? Are you angry all the time? Do you feel like you're done learning? Are you, you know, are you not the person who cares? Are you the person that's continually judging others by exterior appearance? We never know what's going on in someone's life. We make assumptions and that only causes harm. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love each other because he loved us first. Amen. We love because he loved. My wife shared this quote with me. I love it. It says, God is too big to live in our box of systematic theology, denominational dogma, and personal philosophy. His truth is in the book, not a box. Amen. His truth is in the book. And you know what book I'm talking about. It is in there. Yeah, that's right. It is in there. The truth in there will never be shifted and never be changed. One translation says this. One not, not one jot or tittle will pass away. Not one stroke of the pen will ever fade. Truth is eternal. And God does not live within the box of our systematic theology or denomination or our philosophies. It does not fit in there. And the truth is, is no sinner is irreparable or irredeemable. No sin is so great that the blood of Jesus cannot cover it. His love is so deep. His love is so wide that he can, in a moment of our faith, forgive our past, our present, and give us hope for the future. Sin is simply not a problem for God. And when you see the love, the grace, and truth of Christ himself unified with his very spirit. It takes our breath away. It is the wind that causes our sails to open. Jesus is different. He indeed did not wink at sin, but he didn't write them off either. He didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't say, oh, it's okay, you know, everything's going to be fine. No, he was honest and he was real. Time after time in the Bible, we find a, a hardcore sinner seated around the table of Jesus because he offered love, he offered grace, he offered truth. They would spend hours listening asking questions, laughing probably, and crying. We, we have this like, um, for those of you who know what emo is, we have like this emo Jesus in these, in these um, movies and stuff like that where he's kind of like this iridescent color and it looks like he's floating around everywhere. All right, Jesus is not like that. He's got a dynamic personality. He is incredible in his emotion and his engagement of people. And I'm sure that they sat down and they just listened. They were captivated by the words he had to say. They probably asked a lot of questions. Nowhere in scripture do we see Jesus sitting back at a table full of sinners and saying, you're wretched because you did this. You are the problem because of this. This is a mess in your life. You got to deal with this. Jesus's offer was always at the beginning love. 
Now, I'm not saying that life change doesn't happen when we experience Christ, but it is always the secondary. Understand what I mean by that. Jesus' love and us finding him and surrendering our life to him is always first. Everything begins to change after that. It is not the other way around. We don't change to accept him. We don't change to fit into what we, uh, what others have determined is good enough. We experience him and then our life begins to change. And we must see our own appetite to judge others. We must see our own appetite in that judgment and what it's caused to, to the damage that it's caused others. We are overstuffed and unconcerned in our hearts. We take and take and take and take. We have gorged ourselves on a manipulated gospel. A gospel full of additives that is unhealthy. And as Jesus said to, his, to the Pharisees of his time, the very words coming out of their mouth were the same as an open grave. That is blunt. That means that death, things that come from death, are being spewed out of their words. The invitation for each of us is to abandon judgment. What God wants us to do is to abstain from condemnation, to forego punishment and pursue love. It demands that we feed others rather than ourselves. It demands that we do something. You know, we want to believe in revival, but we have, that's a Christian term, just so you guys know. Um, that is a thought that we have in our mind. We think that revival is a bunch of people flooding our churches. You know what revival is? is a bunch of people flooding out of our churches into streets and into sidewalks. Not that you don't come back, but revival is when you walk out there and you begin to do something with the truth that you have been given. God wants us to separate ourselves from that judgmental attitude. John 3.16 is a beautiful text. And I'm going to say this again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We forget verse 17 so much. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to, that the world through him might be saved. His son is here for the purpose of of freeing us from our sinfulness and offering us freedom in this life and offering us eternal life forever. And he didn't come into this world to condemn it. He came to rescue it. He came to rescue people. He came to set people free.